20, verse 17. Let's read this together. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Let's pray. Today, Father, I ask you to do beyond what I can do as a communicator. Holy Spirit, we need your help. I pray that you would touch every person that hears my voice this morning, that it would be the oracles of God, and that, Father, we would be ministered to, encouraged in the place that we need it the most to be able to stand still and see your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so we've been on this a number of weeks. Uh, this is the seventh week I've been teaching on this, and we're learning that even though the command was to stand still. To be able to stand still properly, there is preparation and there's a mindset that you and I need to be in to be able to allow God to fight our battles for us that we can be victorious. We saw a very similar command in Exodus 14, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Say no more. Say forever. See, God not only conquers our enemies today, he conquers them forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Somebody say peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. So even though God gives us a command to stand still as we prepare our hearts as we stand firm on the promises of God, God's intention is to move us forward in his plan for our lives. And I believe that learning to stand still, as we talked about briefly last week, in the midst of adversity is really learning to live life from a place of rest, a place of rest. And this is kind of where we left off a week ago, Hebrews 4. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. And this is referencing, of course, when God, uh, in Genesis, we see the creation story. God created everything in six days, and, and he looked, and he said, ah, this is good. How many know God declares that his work is good? So let me declare this over you. You're his work, and so God says, you're good. If you're watching this message, I want you to know God says that you're good. And so God took a rest and said, it is good. And so there's a rest for you and I to enter into. And when you look at Vine's Greek New Testament, it says that it's not a rest from our work, but in our work. I want you to get a hold of that. Because the rest that Hebrews is talking about, yes, it's referencing God's rest in creation, but it's more than just taking a specific day. And that's what we want to discuss a little bit this morning. We are to rest in our work. It's a kind of rest that really was not available until Jesus came, lived a sinless life, was crucified, dead, buried, and rose from the dead, and now is seated at the right hand of the Father. Until he did that work for you and I, this rest was not available for the people of God, but it is a rest in work, not from work. In fact, I said last week, rest is total satisfaction in Christ. That's so good. Total satisfaction in Christ. And have you ever noticed much of the time in our lives we're worried, we're emotionally upset, uh, willingly trying to take care of everything ourselves and figure out how to cover up things and make sure every, everything gets met, that, that is certainly not rest. And that's what God wants to deliver us from, to learn how to lean on him and get our strength from him. It's so funny to me, you know, how many times do we say something like this? Well, God, I just don't know what I'm going to do. You know, we, we say things like that. But, you know, in the same breath we say, I don't know what I'm going to do. We turn and we tell God what he should do for us. Think about that, how silly that is. I don't know what to do, but God, this is what you should do. Again, rest is total satisfaction in Christ. And Jesus said this in Matthew 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. So Jesus brings us this rest. And when you look at this, this verse here, see, a, a rabbi's yoke was his teaching. So Jesus said, take my teaching upon you, learn from me. That's what the rabbis would say. Well, his yoke is this or his yoke is that. And so it's their teaching, their doctrine. And the Pharisees, the religious people of Jesus' day, they had taken the Ten Commandments and a bunch of others. In fact, there's hundreds of commandments. And what they did is they provided great restrictions, punishable by death, 
And these are all listed in the law, but they took it as a way really not to uh, find freedom, which was always God's intention, but really to keep people pinned under a physical law, a way of doing things so people could be controlled. But how many know he who the Son says free is free indeed? Come on. And Jesus came to give us freedom, not to limit our ability to live life. In fact, Jesus said that the law was given so that we could have real life. Mark 12, 30 and 31, he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your brother as yourself, that all the commandments were fulfilled in love. You think about it. I'm not going to turn there this morning, but you can if you like later today. 1 Corinthians 13, most of us know the great love chapter. And so if you think about living a life in the love of God, patient, kind, not promoting ourselves, but putting others first. If we would live life this way, that is what God wants us to know, is we can live a life of rest and peace that is really the fruit of living in the love of God. So what did te Jesus teach about the Sabbath? I want to show you this morning what he taught, and we're going to discuss it. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain, and the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was not made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And so what he's saying is, look, he was breaking the religious law, the traditions, by feeding his men. How many know, when we live a life of rest, God calls us to a place to meet the needs of others. When we're living in a place of rest, we're allowing God to meet our needs, to give us the victory, and then we can go and lead others and meet their needs. See, the religious scholars of Jesus' time, they had turned the law into some external adherence to the law rather than cultivating an attitude of submission to God. And listen, you cannot live in the love of God without submitting to God. We talked about this a week or probably two weeks ago, I guess, that we're supposed to stand in victory resisting the devil, but the Bible says submit to God first. If we don't submit to God in obedience, allowing his love to really just consume us, we are not, we can think we're wrestling all day long, but we are not resisting the devil. It's something we're doing in our own strength. And so it's the love of God. See, the religious of Jesus' time, the religious people of Jesus' time, it became a source of pride. They could puff, themsel puff themselves up and say, we've done this, we fast three days a week. We pray, we do this, we tithe, we do all these things. Now, it's good to fast, how many know? Jesus said that we should fast, we should pray, and we should give. Three things that Christians should, should do. Fast, pray, and give. We should live generous lives, but not as a way of puffing ourselves up. And that is not rest, all right? The rest that Jesus gives is rest from having to earn our own righteousness or keep our own righteousness, which comes from the law. Jesus earned it for us, and only and you and I enter that finished work and live for him. Look what it says in Colossians about the, uh, the finished work of Jesus. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Colossians 2, 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. I want you to note that. Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ, all right? The substance of Christ. Let's read on verse 19, Colossians 2, 19. And not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? These things indeed have an appearance. Think about that word, appearance. We already pointed out the word substance, this is appearance, so it doesn't have substance. It's an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body. But our no value, no value against the indulgence of the flesh. 
See, substance, Jesus' body, he fulfilled the law. He's saying, don't let someone judge you in keeping this feast and that feast and this Sabbath and that thing. He's saying, look, this will do no good against the indulgences of the flesh. In fact, let me just say this. Many times, trying to live that way only makes the indulgences of our flesh stronger because living that way is something that is promoted by our natural man, our flesh. It's something we're doing. Well, if I just keep a Sabbath or if I do this and that and, and have this right kind of feast that I keep and if I write my tithes, and it's good to tithe. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we live this way that's natural where we're checking off the boxes, we are not living in the fullness of the Spirit of God that Christ came to bring us. In fact, being part of a body of believers... Not following regulations, but being part of a body of believers. Ephesians 4.16 says that's how spiritual nourishment comes. These other things, keeping traditions alone that are of the law, just do this, don't do that. The Bible says that they have no value against the indulgence of the flesh. But Ephesians 4.16 says if I'm part of a body, I'm nourished. And when every part does its part, we're all nourished together. And that's how life comes. It's through a body of believers praying for one another, living life together. And even though a physical rest can be beneficial, I'm not saying that. Understand that it will not automatically bring rest to our mind, our will, and our emotions. In fact, the more we can develop and maintain the type of rest that we're not doing on our own, by keeping this or that or taking a day, again, there's nothing wrong with taking a day, but we're not going to get inner rest See, God wants us to have an inner rest, and that's how we release God to fight our battles. You think about it. You can lay in bed all day. You can go sit at the beach, all right? You can relax with whatever your favorite drink is, and if all you do is think about all the things that you're not going to think about, <laughs> you're thinking about them. See, it's not getting to a physical place. Going to a physical place will never bring internal rest in and of itself. It's something that only Jesus can give. Hebrews 4.11. It says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Strive to enter indicates that we may have to learn some new lessons. What he's saying is you don't want to miss this. You need to make sure you make effort. Listen, we're going to make effort at something. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying we should make an effort to strive, to learn some new things so that we can be sure to enter the rest that God gives us. Not a rest that we make on our own just by resting from work. But remember when we started talking today, it's a rest in work, not a rest from work. We can be extremely busy in the call of God, in the will of God for our lives, but continue to live out of a place of rest. When you take a look at the life of Jesus, certainly Jesus did take time away and what have you, but Jesus never lived life in a hurry. Jesus is a perfect example of living in rest. He was busy. I mean, everywhere he went, there were people. And he ministered because he walked and lived in peace and rest, and he gives the same thing to you and I. So what are some of the lessons and things we need to change in an effort to be able to enter the rest that the writer of Hebrews references? Well, number one, we need to learn to let worry go. So many times we worry, and we spend so much time worrying. And let me just say this. The longer we worry, the longer we delay the help that God wants to give us. We spend so much time worrying, and you realize if you could take that energy and just... Pray and seek God. Read his word. Meditate on his word. Casting your care upon him. I'm talking spiritually, mind, will, emotions. I'm not talking, again, about a physical rest, but casting your burdens, knowing what the word of God says about your situation. And, and, and you may or may not know this. Worry can cause a lot of physical symptoms and problems as well. You and I need to learn to deal with our lives as they are, not as, all, as the... We need to learn to deal with them as they are, not the way we wish they were. <laughs> Isn't that what we do? We, we waste so much time worrying about how we wish our lives were rather than enjoying what it is we do have. I want you to get that this morning. God wants you to enjoy the life that you have. Listen, he knew you were going to be here today. 
He knows that you're going to work today, tomorrow, the next day. He knows your life because he fashioned it. He created it. And so every step of the way with the, the, the joyous events, along with the hardships that we face, God already knew them beforehand, and he is with you, and he has paved the way. And if you miss the enjoyment that you have today, you are missing a portion of the life that God has created you for. So not only do we need to look at ourselves the way we are and, and, and have peace with that rather than wishing we were different, how about this one? We need to look at people and learn to love them the way they are or for who they are rather than wanting them to be a different way. But isn't that what we do? We wish our lives were different. We wish things looked differently. And then we look at people and we can't love them for who they are. We think, well, they should do better than this. They should be better than that. And I understand those statements. Certainly, there's always room for improvement. But we live our lives judging ourselves, judging others, rather than just accepting us where we are, loving ourselves, loving one another for where we are. See, we cannot base our joy and peace on our circumstances. I'm going to read quite a portion of Scripture here, but I want you to realize that Paul the Apostle, when he wrote so much of the New Testament, he addressed this in one of his letters to the Corinthian church. I'm going to read a number of verses. Hopefully you can read along with me. 1 Corinthians 7. By the way, if you want to follow along, you can go to Uversion. I should have said this earlier. Go to Uversion on your phone. It's an app. Again, it's called Uversion. You go on there, and you can look to events, live. You'll find Resurrection Life Church notes. You can hit save, and it'll be saved. You can look at it later. Again, Uversion. Check it out. Live events. You'll see our notes right there. 1 Corinthians 7, 27 through 35. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world as not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. Remember a couple of weeks ago how we found out that we use the very things God gives us to enjoy as excuses to not be able to serve him? So Paul's writing the very same thing. It says in verse 32, But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you. Understand, it's about freedom. Say freedom. He says, but for, but for that which is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distractions. Okay, what is he saying? Paul the Apostle is not saying, look, ignore your spouse. That's not what he's saying. He's saying when you live only for the natural things, you are not going to be able to serve the Lord without distractions. In fact, I believe with all my heart, if we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, strength, and then love others. See, you cannot love others or serve others if you just want to serve your wife or serve your husband and don't serve God first and allow his love to permeate your very nature, you are not going to be able to live for God. You're going to be constantly trying to meet the needs in your spouse's life. And even though it's, it's a great joy to be married and to help meet one another's needs, what Paul is saying here is, look, we need to live without distractions. Stop using our excuses as a way to not be able to live for God. See, it starts with surrendering to God first. Remember, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So we got to submit to God in all things. In doing so, we serve others well. In fact, you and I need to realize if we can't change it, we need to cast it. 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, Cast your care upon the Lord because he cares for you. So we need to stop worrying. We need to stop trying to make things work. If we would just, listen, husbands and wives, if you would just make Christ the center of your life and serve him together in the will of God for your lives, wanting to 
be obedient to him and love him, your lives and your family's lives would do so much better. So many times we get so busy running over here and running over there. and We got we to gotta make sure we get this and we got to get that. And the kids got to get involved in this and the kids need to get involved in this. Listen, if we would come together, I, I'm declaring right now that our homes have got to become a place of prayer. Our homes have got to be a place where our children see moms and dads in all of their imperfections praying clumsy prayers because God hears the cries of his people. Our children need to see us praying. And, you know, we believe here at Resurrection Life Church, when, when kids get to be about 13, 14, we want them in the service here. They can sit next to their parents. In fact, over the last 15 weeks or so, as we've had in-person service, we've had children from 11 years on up uh, in service with us. Even younger than that, my goodness, we've had children in here from four on up. And, of course, we're not going to continue that because I think, you know, four, five, six-year-olds, many of them, maybe don't understand some of the things we talk about here. But when you reach your teenage years, see, in, in, in the Jewish tradition, at 13, a man, that would be his bar mitzvah. That's when he became a man. And, and so boys and girls at that age, they considered to be entering into adulthood. And so, boy, I tell you, you and I as parents, listen to me, we can't keep expecting other people to do things for our kids. We got to do it ourselves. We got to bring Prayer in our homes, a place of rest, a place of peace, not perfection, not doing this and doing that. So Paul was saying, look, live as if you didn't have responsibilities. He's not saying don't fulfill the responsibilities, but don't let them consume you. Don't worry about them. Number two thing I think we need to learn is having a false sense of responsibility. Some people live that way, feeling they're responsible for things that they're not responsible for. Are you one of those people continually trying to fix things for other people? Thinking about how other people could do things better than they are? Thinking, boy, if I was them, I'd do it this way, and then trying to fix it for them. Let me just say this. You should be saving your emotional strength and energy for your own life, not trying to fix everybody else's life. No, it's one thing to serve and love somebody, but listen, you can't look at somebody, as we said earlier, be, ha be unhappy with the way they are and then try to make them something else. You can't fix that, all right? <laughs> somebody said you can't fix stupid. You just need to accept it, right? All right. But we do. We run around. We spend all this emotional energy and strength fixing other things, worrying about other people. And, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? And what are, you, listen, you just believe God and love people. Love God, love people. Anything God wants us to do is going to work out, and we can do it peacefully. Romans 8, 28, it says, And all things work together for good for those who love the Lord or what? called according to his purposes. We need to live life that way. If you and I enter into this life of the Spirit that Romans 8 is talking about, the culmination of all that in 29 says that all things will work together. Things don't work together automatically. We've got to live in the Spirit. We can't live under laws and regulations. Oh, I'm not going to turn there. But read Romans 8. It'll bless you. It's so important that we learn to live this way, learn to live life this way. One sign you may not be in your lane of responsibility, remember we're talking about a false sense of responsibility, one sign that you may be in the lane of responsibility that is not your lane is you don't have the fruit of God's peace. Isaiah 55, verse 12, it says that God will lead you in and out with his peace. And so if you're trying to get involved in an area that's not your responsibility, you don't have peace. Listen, if you're in an area where you're trying to fix something and you've got unrest in your spirit, stop. It's probably not yours to fix. Remember, we're entering rest in work, not rest from work. Maybe you're not supposed to fix it. Maybe you're trying too hard to fix it in your own. Maybe you're not really allowing God to be able to take charge of your life. And that's a sure sign we're probably doing something that we're not meant to do and it's not ours to do. Next thing I want to talk about is anxiety. Listen, anxiety, there's no reason for you and I to be anxious about the future. All right? Let me say, and you know why? Because it isn't here yet. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with preparing for the future. That is not what I'm saying. But do you know the devil wants us to be uh, really so depressed 
and ashamed of our past and worried about the future that, again, we miss today. Remember, God wants us to enjoy life where we are, not someplace we think we should be. Amen. And so we need to realize that we can really have anxiety worrying about the future. It's one thing, plan for the future, save a little bit of money, make some goals. Those are all good things. But don't spend time worrying about it. When you worry about it, you cannot enjoy your day. You cannot enjoy the people in your life that God wants you to love and show them how much he loves them. You're going to lose a great deal of life spending your present living when you live in the past or when you worry about the future. See, God will fight our battles over past mistakes and make them work out for good if we release those mistakes to him. Matthew 6, 34 Look what Jesus said. Most of us know this. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. You see that? Don't worry about tomorrow. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We can spend so much time worrying about what's going to happen. Again, the future's not here yet. Don't worry about it. None of us know how long we have to live, but we all got up today, didn't we? Listen, we don't know that we'll even have tomorrow. We don't know that we'll have five or ten years from now. I mean, I could leave this service today, and my life could end right like that. In fact, James says that our life's a vapor anyway. Even if we live to a ripe old age, it's still a vapor. We have no guarantee for tomorrow, so you and I need to spend today loving God, loving people. Standing still, allowing God to fight our battles and stop worrying so much about what our lives should be rather than enjoying what we actually have. No matter how much time we have, we should maximize enjoying our lives, holding on to our peace. Trust God to do the things that we cannot do. Matthew 6, Jesus goes on. Actually, he says this prior to the verse we just read. Look at this. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you, of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first, say, seek first. Say again, seek first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does that mean? The right standing that Jesus has purchased for you, your righteousness. Seek the kingdom of God and your relationship and right standing with him. And all these things you desire are going to be added to you. So don't worry. Don't be anxious. Don't get involved doing things that you shouldn't be doing. False sense of responsibility. And remember this, God always always gives us the victory. Psalm 34, 19. Many hardships and perplexing circumstances confront the righteous, but the Lord rescues him from them all. Oh, let that be peace and rest to your spirit today. God rescues us from all of our hardships, the perplexing circumstances in our life. Yeah, we're going to go through difficulties in life. There's no question but we can take comfort in God's promise to give us the victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, it says that he has given us the victory through Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, God is not the author of our hardship or the suffering that we face in life, because we do face hardships and suffering, but he's not the author of it. He delivers us when we trust him, when we obey him, and you gotta remember the devil is a liar and he's the father of lies, John 8, 44. Don't you allow him to lie about your past, to lie about your future. You realize that in all these things, Jesus has given us the victory. See, Satan provokes times of pain and misery in our lives and he wants us to use, he wants to use them to discourage us, to get us to a place where we draw away from God where we draw away from other people, please hear me today. That's not God's best for you, drawing away from people, taking a rest from people. Oh, I realize sometimes we need to get away from one another, right? We do. But God doesn't want us withdrawing just because things are uncomfortable, just because there's some pain or discomfort in our lives. God will make an attempt to help us mend 
issues to help us make things better. The devil will try to get us thinking, well, it must be a way that I sinned or maybe this person did that. And we start worrying about why these hardships come. If you're going through a hard time right now, listen, don't you allow the devil to distract you into thinking, oh, it must be some sin I committed. Now, understand me, just living a flagrant life, never being aware of our sin is not what I'm suggesting. But do you realize most of the time, that's not why hardships come? Hardships come just because life brings hardships. Certainly, we should do a personal inventory, but gosh, don't start worrying. I've had people say, you know, somebody gets an illness, and someone will say, well, where did you let the devil in? I'm just telling you, that is not good advice. It may be true, but most of the time, it's not. Hardship just comes. You and I need to keep our focus on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Because I'm telling you, nowhere in God's word does he promise us to have a, a life that is free of trouble. Jesus said this in John 16, These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations. Do you see how he's saying you're going to have problems? But be of good cheer if I've overcome the world. So he's saying you're going to have problems in life. You're going to have mishaps. You're going to have hardships. You're going to have perplexing circumstances. But he says, be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Hey, what do you know? I had this in my notes. Let's read it together, Romans 8, 28. I just quoted it a minute ago. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose, called according to his purpose. See, focusing on God's promises in the midst of our suffering is the thing that is going to keep us from being discouraged. When you're suffering, you've got to remember that it's going to come to an end. Say this with me. Say, this too shall pass. Say, this too shall pass. Even these two weeks that we're apart and, and have to just have services together on Facebook or on our website, however you're viewing today, this too shall pass. This COVID shall pass. This hardship you're in right now, it shall pass. You need to realize that. You're passing through something, and it can make you stronger if you allow it to do so. See, suffering is really a good time for you and I to exercise our faith and learn how to trust more in God. You know, this, even this opportunity this week, man, when we got the information Thursday, I cannot tell you. My Thursday, if you were praying for me Thursday, thank you. But you know, it was an opportunity, and even though I had lots of phone conversations, some video meetings all through the day, how to deal with this thing we're, we're facing in, over the next couple of weeks, all these thoughts, my mind was like, oh my gosh, do you know that deep down I had peace? I was tired, didn't sleep the best that night, but you know, I had God's peace, and I had a great day the next day, and the next day, and today I'm having a fantastic day. You can be facing the greatest hardship of your life, but if you'll turn it over to God and say, you know what, these are my thoughts, but God, I cannot control Sunday morning. We're just going to do what we think you told us to do, and we're going to believe that you are working all things together for our good. Don't spend so much time trying to figure out why you're going through something or why life is so hard. Let me encourage you with this. Remember, you're going through something. You're going to come out. On the other end, I heard someone say this years ago. If you're going through something, keep going. Bible said, remember, he told Moses and the children of Israel, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Move forward. Don't complain to me, but move forward by standing still, by having rest in our work, not from work. God will move us in to our future. I want to encourage you this morning. You are not alone in your suffering. God is with you. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. I want to encourage you this morning. Whatever you're going through, and we're all going through this together, being apart. And the enemy wants to say, well, who's going to get COVID next? Don't worry about it. Will people get it? Yeah, people are getting it. But we can pray that this too shall pass and that people are healed quickly and that those, that, that, that those COVID uh, cases are lesser every day in Jesus' name. 
But he says we can be going through the fire and it not even burn us. Think about that. The fire that you're facing individually in your life. The waters that seem like they're up to your neck and there's no way you can swim in it anymore. God says you will not drown. See, discouragement is one of the devil's goals. That's what he does. His goal is to get you discouraged. He wants us to feel downcast in our emotions. He wants our thoughts to become negative and spiral downward so that you and I lose our hope. See, even our posture can be affected. See, the devil, he loves to get you thinking this way, getting discouraged, and then we walk around like this. Pretty soon we're like, my life will never be the way it should. See, we can get down. We can kind of walk around slumped over, arms down, head down. But here's what God says in Hebrews 12. Therefore, strengthen the hands that hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. You see, stand up straight. I don't care what you're going through today. It may be very miserable. It may be very potentially discouraging, but you got to stand still, add attention, keep your shoulders back, your chest out, and keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't allow the devil to cause you to walk around all cast down, all hunched over because your life is no good. See, our problem often begins with disappointment. And don't we have disappointing times in life? And that's where it all starts, disappointment. And then if we dwell on disappointment long enough, you know what happens? You and I get discouraged. And then we can move from discouragement to depression or even despair. See, that's the process the devil wants to take us on, disappointment moving to being discouraged, to depression or despair. Maybe this morning you're discouraged. Maybe you're in a depression state. Maybe you feel despaired about your situation. God says, stand up straight. Even though your knees may seem feeble or your arms are hanging low, stand up straight. See the salvation of God. Let him heal you in that area of your life. See, when we live with an attitude of despair, we can be tempted to give up. And perhaps that's where you are this morning. You're tempted to just throw in the towel. I got to tell you, honestly, Thursday when we got the word that we got, I, I did. I felt like, you know what? That's it. And you know, God has, has had his hand on us through this COVID experience this year. But I want to tell you something. It hasn't been easy on any of us. And it certainly isn't easy on any pastor or leader of a ministry. It's been really any business leader, none of us. But there's been so many different things you have to think about in a place of worship and so many things that come in. And, and so we really just made these decisions. And, and it's, it's, it could take its toll. And when I heard that news, I thought, you know what? I'm done. Matter of fact, I had a conversation with one of our, our leaders, and I'm so thankful for their friendship and for their leadership and they're a little bit younger, but they're on our, our board of directors and board of deacons and, and pastors. And I said, you know, I said, you know what? I'm just going to pass it on to you youngins. You can take it from here. I'm done. Well, of course, I'm not going to do that. But do you realize that's what the devil wanted me to do, to quit, to throw in the towel? But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not. I'm standing at attention, and I don't care what the devil brings. You and I are going through it till we get to it. God is bringing us to a place. I still believe, as we said earlier this year, and so many ministries have said, the finest hours of the church are right around the corner. I believe even into this fall, to the end of the year, even into 2021, we are going to see a great harvest of souls, and we will not quit until we get to be part of that, until Jesus takes us home. So you and I are going to move forward. See, the devil wants us to be tempted to give up, to believe that there's no way out of our trouble and that it's never going to end, and that there's no way out. See, Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father and sent you and I the Holy Spirit, and he will give us the help, the counsel, the comfort, the rest, the peace. See, God has an antidote for every evil that you and I face, and his name is Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. See, the devil is a liar, but God is truth. I'm reminded of a story in 1 Samuel 30. The Bible says that the enemies of Israel and King David had come and they had, they had conquered them. They had taken their families away, taken all their riches. The people who were left were going to stone David. They wanted to kill him. I mean, no, when you're, the people following you want to kill you, that's not a good thing. 
So I'm safe today because nobody's here. You can't kill me. All right. But so, so what they're doing is they say, no, we're going to come and kill you. We're going to stone you. You've allowed the enemy to defeat us. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Listen, you could be facing something that looks like, boy, it's over. Everyone's against me. This is never going to turn out well. But the Bible says that they went and they captured all. Somebody say all. They went and they captured all the riches, all the gold, all the silver, all of their family, all of their loved ones. Because David took time to encourage himself in the Lord. So when we face challenges, we need to take time to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Not take a day of rest, even though that can be good, but rest for our souls, which only comes from the word of God and allowing ourselves to be part of a body of Christ. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your brother as yourself. We can't do this alone. We need each other. And the truth is, sometimes you need to talk to yourself, don't you? You need to tell yourself to snap out of your funk. Psalm 42, it says this. David wrote this. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Mizar. See, perhaps David didn't feel like praising because he's speaking to himself. Why are you cast down? I'm going to praise God. There's times you don't feel like praising God. Please hear me. Get up and praise him anyway. The devil wants us to sit down and hang our heads and let our arms flop down and feel like we can't move forward. Don't allow the devil to steal your position of praise. Don't you allow it. That's where the devil wants you. I don't feel like it. Well, I don't feel like it but I do it anyway. Oh, sometimes, yeah, things may be going great, and well, we'll praise God because things are great, but can you praise him in the storm? Can you praise him when you're facing the greatest fire that you have ever gone through? You know, you, you and I can talk ourselves into a bad mood or out of a bad mood. The choice is our. See, the devil's persistent, and the only way that you and I are going to beat the devil is if we're persistent. Remember, we need to submit to God. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Then it says resist the devil. What does that mean? To be persistent till we see our victory. Don't pay too much attention to every feeling that you have. In this series, I didn't even have time to get into some of this. And You, you cannot allow your feelings to direct your life. Don't dwell on your feelings and allow yourself to become discouraged. Don't allow it to become the largest thing in your life. See, that's what the devil wants you to do. This problem that you're facing, it's the largest thing in your life. And when all you do is think about it, God becomes smaller and smaller. But if you'll magnify the Lord in your heart, your problem becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's what I'm talking about. See, the pain in your toe, the headache, the disappointment about the promotion you didn't get. Don't allow that to become the biggest thing in your life. You allow God to be magnified and be the biggest thing in your life. Turn it over to him, and he will win the battle for you. See, God knows our frame. God knows that we're weak. God knows our faults. Psalm 103, 14. He knows that we're just flesh. He knows that we're a vapor but he gives us eternal life through Christ Jesus. And it's true that we should examine ourselves, but you and I cannot dwell on our weaknesses. We can't dwell on our shortcomings. We can't dwell on the shortcomings of other people or a situation that we're facing. See, the fact that God fights our battles doesn't mean that we're never going to get wounded. Sometimes you're going to get wounded in the war that we're in. But let me encourage you this morning, wounds will heal. Wounds will heal. Allow the Lord to take that root of bitterness. Allow the Lord to be the joy of your salvation once again. And you and I will continue to be stronger in our faith and be able to endure so that when the enemy attacks the next time, we're going to stand even stronger. Understand that. Whatever you're going through is positioning you for the next attack of the enemy where you can be catapulted into your future. Enduring simply means to outlast the devil every time the enemy attacks you outlast him in fact hebrews 5 8 and 9 i'm going to end with this it says that jesus is the author and the source of our salvation hebrews 5 
He's the author and the source of our salvation. Now, where you are this morning, I want you to take time. I want you to pray, examine your heart. Have you allowed Jesus to be the author and the source of your salvation? Whether it's a trial that you're going through, or maybe you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to encourage you, you can do that this morning. Right where you are watching online, whether it's live or later you pick this stream up and watch it, I want you to know that God has a plan for your life. And so we're going to take a moment, we're going to all pray a prayer, a very simple prayer together. If you pray this prayer and you know that something happened on the inside, I want to encourage you to contact our ministry. I'll give you information on that in just a moment. But as we bow our heads before God, I want you to pray with me. I want you to say this. God, I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe he lived a sinless life and died for my transgressions, that he rose for my salvation, and that he is seated at your right hand. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I make you Lord of my life. Amen. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer this morning, contact us. You can text us at 943-0450, or you can contact us through our website, info at getreallife.info. Make sure you do that. We want to get you some information, and we want to encourage you to be water baptized. And let me just say this again. Uh, last week, we had several of you uh, pray a prayer, uh, enter into a relationship, a covenant relationship, if you will, with Jesus. We want to encourage you to be water baptized, so please contact us at info at getreallife.info so we can plan the baptism service that we're looking forward to so we can include everybody that needs to be water baptized. Now, if you're here this morning and you already know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you that as the author and source of your salvation, he is going to bring the victory in your life. In Jesus' name. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.